All right, my friends, welcome to another episode of Principal Liner Notes Podcast. This is episode 102, and I am grateful that you are tuning in with, with my pal, my longtime pal, my, my lifelong bandmate, Liz Bostwick. I welcome you uh, to the Principal Liner Notes Podcast, Liz. Thank you so much, Sean. It is amazing how long we've been connected. I want to say that it dates back to like 2015-ish, 2016. I'm guessing sometime in that time frame. Um, so it's amazing how long we've been connected and remain connected and just celebrating each other along the way. Absolutely. But it, really, it, too, wow. It's been, that's been a while. We've been, we, we've been, <laughs> We, we've we've been connected that long to 2015. So I'm trying to go back. I know yeah. it may not be 2015, but I'm gonna guess at least 2016 is going to be my guess. Although you know, you can feel free to share. I only what I do is I go back in my head and I think about when did I start becoming connected on Twitter, and that was 2015, mm -hmm. 2016, and 17. I began just connecting more with people in just different, the Twitter space and different chats. And I remember one of my first chats that I had jumped into, not even knowing that it was like, you know, a district level chat, but was Wiley chat. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That was, um, that was my first principal ship. And uh, that was, that was really around the time that I started uh, building a PLN and wanting to model, um, you know, tech integration and 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 building connections, and and that was like our school based uh, chat, which then became a, 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 na a national conversation, and and we were able to connect uh, with you from North Carolina here to you in upstate New York. That's amazing. It is amazing. So yeah, you don't quote me on the years, but I'm just I go back because I'm thinking of you know I go backwards in time, and I'm thinking it has to be sometime in that time frame. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, there, there's so much I want to unpack with you in, in our conversation together. Uh, you are someone that, that I, I see as an influencer, uh, not just on a, on a professional level, but also on a personal level. I I'm always inspired by, uh, your story. I'm inspired by the things that you do with, with your family, the things that you, your journey in education, which, which is just so fascinating to me. And, and you're one of those, like, if I come across a, a term or a concept or an idea, or if it's something I see on social media, I will like, I got, I got to run this by Liz. Does she, does Liz know about this? How, what is Liz's thought on this thing or, or this idea or, or this article, or I'm always asking you for, have you read this book or, 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 or what have you? So I, uh, there, there may be a little bit of that too, in our, our conversation, uh, this morning. And I also know that, um, you, you have been one of probably the, the longest and most loyal listeners and tuners into the Principal Liner Notes podcast. So I want to return the favor today by by amplifying your voice and, and having you share your story and your work and your content. So again, I'm just I'm just grateful to jam with you today. Yes, it's it's really quite significant for me to feel like I'm able to be here and to be on your podcast. And yeah, I've, I've been a longtime listener and just always excited to share out your episodes as well. Oh well, thank you. I appreciate that. So Let's let's just cut to the chase. I have a book um, that you wrote, which um, is is just just a masterpiece, and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, Take the leap, ignite a culture of of innovation. Um, I, I wrote the Pepper Effect. Um, I was proud to to uh, to contribute uh, an endorsement and support for your masterpiece of, of uh, Take the Leap. The hashtag is hashtag leap effect. So, so for those who, who are not familiar with the book and familiar with what the leap effect is, uh, I'd love for you to share that. I, I love, I love, sure. and I, and I love how you share it too. So, I, I mean, I'm geeking out right now. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so Take the Leap is all about how you can create. So LEAP is an acronym. So it's all about how you can foster a luminous culture, one that shines the light on every individual's 
um, abilities, potentials, and, and really thinking about how we can all be leaders in our own roles. Mm-hmm. And then it goes into the E for empowered learning. How can we shift to, you know, move our kids? We, we want them engaged, but we also really want them to be empowered in what they're learning. And then, of course, A is for authenticity. So looking at how we can make learning authentic by hands-on. It could be even project-based learning. Um, and in the book, I do not go in-depth with project-based learning, but more about the the elements within PBL. And then, of course, maker education, where students have their opportunities to be able to identify some of their strengths and interests to develop passions. And the P goes into potential. So ultimately, we want our students and our teachers to reach their full potential and find fulfillment in the journey. And, so, um, and I did, and I wrote the book really because um, as much as it says, take the leap, it's not yeah. about this thoughtless risk that we're just diving in. It's more about give yourself the credit that you that you deserve to be able to take steps beyond your boundaries. Take little steps if you need to, and those little steps will grow into a leap. And when it comes to the hashtag of leap effect, Sean, to be quite frank with you, uh, take the leap had already been taken. So oh. I, yeah, so then I kept brainstorming with my husband. I'm like, what else am I going to use with leap? And so leap was actually a commonly used um, hashtag. So I, so I learned along the process. And so we got talking about, because one thing I talk about is that we can join hands and take the leap. Mm-hmm. So that's how it grew into creating the leap effect. Wow. That, I, I, I didn't know that, uh, that little tidbit about the, uh, the hashtag. It can be challenging <laughs> um, to, to not step on somebody's toes on the dance floor on the, in the Twitter sphere, right? Right. Um, that's that, 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 but you just, you just blew my mind there. That's, that's a, hey, that's a little inside scoop. So when this book came out in 2019, I took this with, I, I was just, this had been a book that I had wanted you to write uh, for a long time, because when I first met and connected with you, I, I think I remember, you know, sharing with you, I said, Liz, you are a book waiting to happen. Um, you're the, the things that you were doing, um, you know, as, as an educator and an instructional coach, um, and, and building that, you know, maker mindset and, and STEM Mm -hmm. and STEAM and those things, even the work that you were doing, um, with SEL through Ignite Your Shine, Mm -hmm. uh, our mutual friend, Lavana Roth, um, you know, you, you just, just very intentional connections. And then we had the pandemic and, Probably the, the the furthest thing from anyone's mind was all right. Let's let's take a leap and and ignite a, a culture of innovation. Uh, let's let's it it was let's take a leap and and get into survival mode, which I know <laughs> this is um, true. <laughs> many of us, you know, in whatever role that we are, we are in an education. You know, we, we're we're still hanging in. Uh, into that that mode of survival for for lots of reasons. So with everything that's happened since this book was published in 2019, how I mean any any lessons learned or or further insights you know through that lens of post pandemic and and taking the leap. Well, one thing that I would say is that although I write about how we can create a culture of innovation, the one thing that I have reflected on during the time of the pandemic is that, yes, you're right. Nobody really wanted to be like, how can we be innovative in this moment? However, on the contrary, everybody was innovating in a lot of ways. Just nobody wanted to put it in those terms. And so people were having to think outside the box. They were having to be creative and be thinking about how am I going to reach students? How do I engage them? How do I keep them um, moving forward? And one of the biggest pieces were how do we help our kids thrive? And so then I get thinking about a lot of what I write in my book, as much as it pertains to creating that culture of innovation, it's also focused on how you create a culture where every learner can thrive. Mm -hmm. And really when it comes down to it, and we're thinking Mm -hmm. about innovation, it's not always um, flashy. It's not always something, I think sometimes innovation, that term can be a little bit intimidating to some because they think it's going to have to be something revolutionary and it's not necessarily. Innovation can also be just taking something you already do and renovating it to meet the needs of your learners where they're at. So 
during the pandemic, we were all doing that. Um, even in my role as an instructional technology integration slash instructional coach, I had to think completely differently on how I was going to support the educators who were also supporting students. So it was completely different. And so a lot of through that time frame, it was thinking about how do we create opportunities for everybody to thrive? And then that also boiled down to, and, and one thing I began blogging about a lot was how do we find joy amidst the struggle? How do we find that joy? And I think that was a big piece. So I do, when I think about my book of Take the Leap, Ignite a Culture of Innovation, what comes to my mind is also how do we help everybody to thrive, but also how do we foster joy within our learners and educators? Hmm. I, for for those of you that are listening right now, go back and rewind the last 60 seconds of what Liz just said, because this notion of innovation, it doesn't have to be revolutionary. And so often there's so much hype around that term when that term is thrown around. Um, it can be intimidating, right? It it, it can be inhibiting. Um, and and you just you just flip that you know, that, that notion into this concept of, of joy. Now, when people think of joy in education, um, you know, perhaps the default is kumbaya, holding hands, <laughs> let's all play all you need is love, um, and, 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 and eat donuts. Um, but, but th the way that you frame joy is in a very intentional way there. So, so how do we pursue that 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 notion of joy, and I know you've blogged about this a whole lot in the last like year and a half or or so. Um, what what's what's a first step towards that intentional move to be joy filled or or to or to spark joy in education? Well, I'll be honest. Like when I when I first began thinking about this topic, um, a lot of it had to do with what is creating joy in us. What are those things that recenter us? Now, I'm not a scientist on this topic. However, I've spent a lot of time also listening to the podcast called The Joy Lab. Um, let me say, what is the... The Joy Lab. Joy Lab, yep. And it's about the science of joy. It's, it's, been, it's a really great podcast. And so it's really inspired me to be able to think about joy differently than how sometimes we might hear about it at the surface level. And so I think we have to be careful when thinking about or talking about joy that it isn't about, it isn't just this kumbaya, like, hey, we're just going to ignore all the negatives and let's just hang out and be joyful. I mean, that sounds lovely in one way, <laughs> yeah. but, but I love that the Joy Lab is all about the science of joy. And it's actually by Dr. Henry Emmons and Dr. Prasek. Um, and they do a beautiful job talking about the science of joy. And in one of their first episodes, they go into discussing that Joy, it's something that we can find and we can choose joy even amidst difficulties. Mm -hmm. And so joy is all about identifying what it does have to do with gratitude. It has to do with what do we appreciate in life. And so it's very intentional. And so nobody can just slap a sticker on and be like, okay, I've got my joy sticker on. I'm done. Good. I think joy is something we practice similar to practicing gratitude. Yeah, and, and and very much an echo of our mutual friend uh, Lainey Rowell and and her yes. work with evolving with uh, with gratitude, which is which is so which is a powerful book. I was proud to to have made a, a small contribution to to that beautiful book. So, in terms of in terms of joy and and innovation, um, to to me, you know, one of the things that um, I, I think are are those stepping stones into innovation and those stepping stones into joy is collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, and you are someone that uh, I, I consider a collaborator. Um, I I also love when I see you fostering other other collaborations um, with with others in in the in the professional learning network. So a lot of a lot of the principal liner notes podcast is. It's a it's a conversation, you know, between myself um, and 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 a great guest, but also the principal liner notes podcast is also an attempt to 
invite others into the conversation. Like I always think about that, that person that can't find the courage or can't find the, uh, the chutzpah to, to find someone to collaborate with because of whatever situation they're in. It could be the, just the, you know, the geography, it could be the culture of the school. It, it could be some self barriers, but you, you are one that, that, that is always, I mean, even when I think about, um, back to, um, lead up now and, and lead up teach. I mean, that was, that was a, a, a collaboration of sorts when you were doing uh, that podcast. Uh, I also think about, this is what I went to go run to get right before we, uh, we, we uh, recorded uh, when we did education right now um, yes. and where, where we were um, very, I was grateful to be in the same room with you, uh, you know, co-writing uh, a book together with other other great authors and 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 friends, and I still I still remember you, uh, just typing, <laughs> just so pound like not even typing, like you were pounding, and and uh, just I'm like man, I said whatever she's writing has got to be great because just this just this the, the superhuman pounding that you were doing, I I, I just I was blown away by it. Um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite memories of you, but. How, how, how do we, how do we get started with collaboration? What is, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, how, how, how is that, how can we, we help that lonely educator or administrator uh, who can't either find the time or, or find the chutzpah to, to connect and collaborate? What's that, where, where's the meaning there? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question to talk about and discuss because it makes me remember, makes me think back to when I began collaborating with others and, and really connecting. Now, I was fortunate that I, I did teach on a team when I taught fourth grade. I feel like we were the dream team because we did collaborate. We all um, supported one another. We planned weekly. We delegated the tasks and, and, but it was fun because our principal would walk through and he'd be like, you guys are teaching the same lesson, but it looks completely different in each of your rooms. Nice. So it's kind of neat that you could collaborate, but it can still look unique. And I still, I almost still wish that I had the opportunity to walk through the other rooms because I didn't know what that meant. Exactly. I know it was good, but it, I didn't know exactly what it meant. Um, and so I think about that, like I was very fortunate to have a team, first of all, that I, who I was collaborating with. However, when it came to thinking about like makerspace and um, just trying to do some of the things that I was envisioning in the classroom, that's when I had, I had the opportunity to connect with people online, like on Twitter, because I began looking at maker education and that was a big topic. I, I, I don't know what year it was. I know it was a February. It's one of those things I remember turning to my husband and being like, have you heard of Makerspace? This is right up my alley. Mm -hmm. And so I remember jumping into chats and conversations on the topic of Makerspace. And then the other topic that I was really passionate about was leadership. I think leadership has always been a passion of mine, and I've never been in a traditional leadership role. I've never been an administrator in that way. However, I think, and that's where the lead up teach and lead up now that you're re referencing, that we were all a part of, and we did a lot of great work through the chat, a lot of great, we had a lot of great conversations in our boxer group, but it was around that concept of everybody can lead from their current position, which is some of the topics that I also interwove into my book. But when I think about that, it really came down to connecting on Twitter with people who were also interested in those common topics or threads in those topics. And from there, it was more people would share resources and I would share back. And then before you knew it, you're communicating back and forth and building that relationship. Now, I know some people have said to me like, well, I've joined Twitter and I haven't connected with anybody but it is about joining chats and following up and asking people questions, sharing resources yourself. So there is a reci reciprocal relationship that needs to take place. But I think that there are a lot of people out there who are looking to collaborate. And even people who might already be collaborating with somebody else would still open their arms to say, come collaborate with us. And to me, yeah, I think most of us, aside from my book, most of the work I've ever done is collaborative. I thrive on collaboration. I thrive on working with other people. And, and that's just kind of, I love that work, working with other people and seeing what we can create as a band, as a team, however you want to look at it. 
That is, uh, that, that, that is so true. Um, you know, you do thrive in that when you, when you find the planets that have lined up perfectly for individuals and, and you have that group think and that, and that mindset, it, it, it can, it can really, it can really thrive. Now, um, I always ask you for advice on a lot of levels, um, specifically, and you, you mentioned a podcast, the joy lab, which, which I've taken, taken mm -hmm. note of, um, what are those books that are on your bookshelf that, that, you know, like take the leap is, is my go-to book that my current role, we're, we're, we're doing some work with innovation and, and, and taking some intentional steps to ignite a culture of innovation in, in my current schoolhouse. So this is one of my go-to books uh, for, for that kind of sustenance and that inspiration. What are those go-to books for you that, that um, inspire and, and, and spark joy for you or spark ideas in education or life or uh, dog training or what, whatever? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is kind of funny. I, I am rather eclectic, <laughs> kind of all over the map when it comes to things. Um, when it comes to education, I am going to give you a shout out right back. The Pepper Effect is one of my favorite books. Um, I love the power of innovation, creativity, and all that you tie together in your book. Another one that I always turn to, too, is, oh, did you want to say something on that? No, I'm just saying thank you. I'm just, oh. I'm always honored by that. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. So that's on my, so I have lots of education books all on a couple of bookshelves together. Another one is Make Learning Magical by Tisha Richmond. I think yes. that's a great one. She's got lots of how you can transform your classroom to make it meaningful um, and, and really bringing those gamified strategies in as well. Mm -hmm. And so those are two of my two of my favorite education books. I have quite a few others. I mean, I also love like the edu protocols. Those aren't, not, you know, there's a lot of protocols in there that you can pull in in all different ways. So those are great. Um, when it comes to other books, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. It's a classic. Mm -hmm. It's still yeah. one of my go to I still love the topics in there so and um think again has been a great one Adam Grant yes yeah Adam Grant and so that was a that was one that I listened to as an audiobook uh maybe about a year ago now those are those are great great books and I know um you you and Tisha have uh, have really fostered a really cool collaboration and have got some co kind of common ground in in your your current role um, which uh, I'd lo I'd love for you to share about too your 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 new role with this this little this 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 little organization. Sure. <laughs> so so most currently I am working as a learning consultant with Canva for Education, and so Canva has been around since 2014 13 2013 I believe. Mm -hmm. I began using it for my own business in 2014, and then I remember being maybe in 2018. I began using Canva a bit as an educator because I was like, oh, this would be really cool to bring the student project in, but I couldn't get my students on it. Um, but now we have Canva for Education, which came out slowly over the last couple of years, but really has gained traction in the past year because they have just gone above and beyond creating Canva for Education free for educators K through 12 and their students. And so I have the privilege of just being able to work with educators around the world in bringing Canva to the classroom. But what I love about my role is that it's not training on just how you use the product. I get to work as a learning consultant, leveraging my own strengths um, as a consultant and being able to work with people on how do you really foster meaningful, authentic learning, spark creativity in the classroom, and really empowering students as creators. So it is right up my alley. And again, I have a, an amazing team that I collaborate with, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, they're lucky and they're lucky to have you and lucky to have you in the band. As as a writer, as an author, as as a blogger, I, I'm fascinated by how folks um, string words together. You know, I'm a former high school English teacher, so I'm always fascinated by the writing process and and what people do. You know, it, you know, folks. Um, you know, sometimes I I know of one person who has to jog every time before he sits down to to write. I know of others that that use music. I know of others that that have to uh, seclude themselves in a in a mountain cabin. Uh, I do none of those things uh, when I write, but but what is what is your writing process like? How do you how do you approach, you know, when you get an idea for one of your blog posts or 
as you're as you're thinking about um you, you mentioned um you know you're working on the the, the uh, co co-authoring an article with a mutual friend of ours mm -hmm. um what what's the liz boswick writing process well, Sean, I think just like life, how life has its ups and downs. And it makes me think about, you know, that graphic where they say, where they shows like what you, where you are and where you want to go. And it looks like a straight line, but really yeah. it's like what reality, it's like just a big squiggly line. And I sometimes think that's my writing process um, just in terms of life. Right. So it looks different. I don't mean my writing process is messy, but what I mean by that is that it's been different depending on where I am in the phase of life that I'm in. Mm -hmm. So I used to have a very solid writing process where it would be on the weekends and I would kind of close out myself in the office and just be able to write. But I think through the years, our kids are teenagers. And of course, all the, those dynamics change and different jobs change. I think it's shifted things as well. So for me though, typically if I want to get inspired to go in and write, it is turning to music sometimes. And then my other one is being outside. So I go outside a lot. I go outside in all elements. I'm in upstate New York, so we don't have beautiful weather, but you will find me even if it's negative 15, I will sometimes throw my snow pants, my hats, my gloves, my jackets, and I go outside. So I need to be in nature. I love the feeling of the air and just the wind that may be out there. And that's okay with me, but that's sometimes it, it's really more about secluding myself in a sense in just feeling like I'm in my own space, in my own element, and that will spark inspiration. So in that case, when I have that happen, sometimes I will send myself just notes within my phone, like I'll open that. I use voice to text a lot because if I have my gloves on, I can't type. So sometimes at least I know what I'm reading back to myself yeah. <laughs> because sometimes voice to text doesn't come out right. But that's predominantly, that's kind of my my writing routine, I would say. I have to try that voice to text. Um, you're the second person that has mentioned that. Um, Julie Hassan, um, another mutual friend of ours, uh, uh, ha has um, encouraged me to do that. And and I'm always, there, I, I need the feel. I mean, I know we were joking about you pounding the keyboard uh, earlier, but I, I need that feel of, of the keyboard and, and that physical connection to 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 the letters and the words and and then seeing them come up so so but but voice to text is is something that you you find helpful no it's not how i it's not how i write but it's how i'll jot my ideas down mm -hmm. more like bullet points so that i can then turn that into a blog so the other thought that would be neat is to like i know on my phone there's like the voice memo app and I very easily could open that and just speak into it and just get my ideas down. That's not something I've tried before, but it might be worth giving a shot. Yeah, that is true. Um, you mentioned music. This is the principal liner notes, and and we talk a lot about about music here. So what what are those go to songs for you that spark courage and joy? So I. Just like some other things, I think I'm kind of eclectic. My music taste is all over the map. And yeah. my husband will joke sometimes. He's like, well, good thing we don't ju judge you based on your music because sometimes I don't listen to all of the words all of the time. I don't, I really get into the instrumental or the music piece. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if he's like, you know what they're saying in this song? And I'm like, it's okay. I'm just liking the jam. <laughs> so, um, but some of the songs I think that I, I would say, like, give me courage, um, maybe hype up songs. Like if I'm feeling like, okay, I need to go into this and um, really do my best job and just feel my best self. I think my go-tos would be High Hope, Panic at the Disco. Mm -hmm. I love that song. And then Best Day of My Life um, by American Authors. That's right. I yeah. So I love I those two songs. Um, but yeah, even sometimes there's, other, but I have so many songs, like, there's even songs by the Red Hot Chili Peppers that I love to turn on that I think are just really good pump up songs if I'm going into like an event or just looking for energy. And I think sometimes bringing that energy in can also foster courage as well. Yeah, that so uh, I, I was thinking on that one. Yeah, no, I gave I gave you a preview of, the, of that of that question. <laughs> so here's a pop quiz. What what? What what a, you you mentioned and you don't need to go into specific songs, but you you mentioned like man I I you know Mike your husband saying do you know what that means or or what have you we we won't we won't talk about those songs this is a family show Liz but 
but uh, what what are what are your guilty pleasures in music? No judgment. I mean, yeah, no, it's, it's I'm all, all over it's, the place too. It's but. all good, and I, I'm I'm. I'm not even going to feel bad about it. I don't always know the artists in which I'm listening to because sometimes it's just what pops on the radio or in my iTunes or what's playing at the gym. Um, but a lot of it's like 1990s, early 2000s, hip hop, rap kind of music. So I think a lot of it will play at my gym and then I'll be like, oh, this is something I love jamming to the song. And then Mike's like, Liz, are you listening? I'm like, no, I don't want to listen to, I'm not going to listen to the lyrics. I just <laughs> like, the music and I'm just going to jam to this. So this is good, <laughs> but I think it's okay. I think it's okay to have a wide variety of taste in music too, because I think there's, there's a different tune for whatever mood we're in. You know, I'm also a fan of Adele. Like there's a lot of Adele songs. I like yeah. there's some Taylor Swift songs I like. So that's why I say my music is all over the map. And when I was in high school, I was also into listening to the grateful dead and we listened to fish I went to a couple of fish concerts and just different festivals at the mm -hmm. time. So I've always had a deep appreciation for music. Um, the one full album that I own of music is Tom Petty. So I was a huge Tom Petty fan growing up. And that was the one person. So I've been to a few festivals where I've seen like lots of different artists or I've been to Dave Matthews. Um, we've gone to Maroon 5. So those have all been great. But the one that I really wanted to see was Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And I never had the opportunity. And I still feel disappointed because I remember there was a concert that would have been like three hours. And I remember thinking, well, I could make it work. And I should have made it work because after that, I never had the opportunity again. Tom, Tom Petty is somebody and I still can't believe he's not with us anymore yeah. because he was such a musical fixture of, of my childhood um, you know, he was in the Traveling Wilburys with, you know, Dylan and George Harrison. Uh, I love that album, Full Moon Fever. That was, that was like a big album for me, my sophomore year in college when it came out. Um, and we, it's, it's, I, I, I remember saying this to my oldest daughter, you know, who's a big Tom Petty fan, the, the album Wildflowers is one yep, of Yeah, this was mine too. Yeah. She, she just, and she loves the title track. Um, it's like, I, I regret that we took Tom Petty for granted because he was just always somebody that was around, right? Mm -hmm. He was, he was everywhere and and you heard his music all the time on, on the radio. You saw it on MTV. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm still, I still can't believe he's not with us. Same, same with, um, Christine McVie mm. and Fleetwood Mac, another, kind of person you know we take these folks for granted in in music yeah. well she's always going to be around oh I'll, I, I won't see Fleetwood Mac this time mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go and, and see him in a couple of years or you know Tom I, I've had like three or four opportunities to see Tom Petty and I don't know you know what he, he's yeah. always around I'll 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 go and and then sadly he's he's not you know so yeah I love Fleetwood Mac too so yeah my my music tastes are kind of all over the map um, actually, one of my first concerts that I went to, not that this whole conversation is about music, but one of my first live concerts um, was Green Day. And then my second one, I think, was Ben Folds Five. So that was an interesting one, too. So, yeah, it's just my music taste has been all over the map. But I think that's good. I think it keeps you just kind of in tune with, I don't know, all different people, all different walks. And like I said, like different days, there's different jams. So if you are ever in my town of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and um, you you are passing through North Carolina on your way to your vacation spots in South Carolina, um, please come to Winston-Salem. Of course, we, you know, visit with the family and the Gaylor girls and all of that, but Ben Folds, I, I have the, I'm probably um, the, the, the rare person in that I have stepped foot in all three of his schools because he grew up here in Winston Salem. Oh, cool. So I I taught at Reynolds High School, where where he uh, was a student there. I was principal at Wiley, uh, Wiley Chat, Wiley Magnet Middle mm -hmm. School, where he um, his band teacher. I had the distinct honor of dedicating uh, the band room to his band music teacher, and on a whim, you know, I took the leap and I, I reached out to Ben Folds uh, on his website. 
and just said, hey, my name's Sean Gaylord. I'm Principal Wiley. We're dedicating the band room to um, Chick Shelton, uh, your old band teacher. If you're in town, we we, we would love to... Um, we would love to see you. Um, he, he, it didn't happen, but I ended up having a few phone conversations with Ben Folds and, um, and had the honor of reading a, uh, a letter on his behalf at the dedication there. So, um, and then I was principal at his elementary school at Moore. So, uh, the, the six degrees of separation of Ben Folds, wow. I love ben Folds five, I love Ben Folds. Need to, get awesome. him on the, uh, need to get him on the podcast. Yeah, uh, you certainly do. Yeah. When I saw, um, them play it was I think at Ithaca College so it was like a small venue um, and it would have been I'm gonna guess like 1996 oh wow I want to say maybe my junior year in high school somewhere in there so yeah that's amazing uh great great stuff I love uh, I love all of his all of his music um, um the battle of who could care less is one of my favorites but he's he's just somebody I'm, I'm a big fan of um and he is, he is based here, uh, or, or I don't know if he's not based here now, but, but yeah. in Winston. So, um, that's awesome. What a great story about just the schools and you being able to connect and call and then dedicate the room. That's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, that, that's my, my six degrees of separation. Um, yeah. but, but not as cool as seeing him in his heyday at, at Ithaca college, which is, I, I love seeing bands in smaller, me too. Venues and, and things like that. So Liz, what is, you know, speaking of taking the leap, are there things that you are getting ready or currently taking the leap on? Project? Oh, funny you should ask, Sean. So yes, uh, actually we will be, I will be releasing a podcast soon, a collaborative podcast with my dear friend, Tisha Richmond. So mm-hmm. Tisha is also a Canva learning consultant and she and I, We've been connected for a long time on social media, um, sharing back and forth, but we, and we've connected at conferences. So we connected at ISTE Philadelphia at the same time you and I were able to, That's we connected right. there too, enjoyed some cheesesteaks together. Um, right. But I had connected with her in person there and at some other locations, but now we work, we both work with Canva. And so it's through this opportunity at Canva that we really got into talking about our books, our experiences, and it's amazing how many how many common threads we have, and then even how complementary our books are in a lot of ways. And they're complementary yet very different at the same time. So it's really neat to be able to just have those conversations. And Tisha talks a lot about um, sparking joy within the classroom as well. And so we really got having those conversations on what does it mean to live a joyful life? What does that really mean? And so we are launching a podcast called Spark Joy in EDU. And the um, subtitle is take a joyful, take a joyful leap. Um, sorry, let me back up. Take a magical leap into joyful learning. Nice. Sorry, it is that new. So, so we combined our two t- titles. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I, I'm a big fan of, of, of Tisha as well. Uh, and I'm so glad that you two are connecting and collaborating. And I look forward to, to that podcast and, and, you know, there are great similarities in your books and in your kind of instructional cores. And so I'm glad that you have found kinship. Um, and I know it's going to influence and inspire and uplift uh, a lot, a lot of folks. So, uh, and it is needed right now, yeah. especially as we're, you know, getting through some of the malaise of, of the post pandemic and, 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 and challenges in, in our world right now. So when, when is, is that going to drop later this year? Well, we're hoping possibly within the next week or two. Nice. So yeah, we've just been doing a little bit of work. So we are doing, we have an intro episode with just the two of us kind of giving the backstory of our own stories, mm-hmm. why we've come together, why this topic is near and dear to our hearts. And then we do have a couple of episodes that are recorded. We're just waiting to kind of get all of our ducks in a row. Um, And both of us have been having just different, we both were at FETC and then she's been at TCEA and now at IdeaCon. So lots of different things. So different schedules we're balancing and we're plus we're in completely different time zones of she's on Pacific time and I'm at Eastern time. So um, yeah. And so we're just going to wait until we have everything just where we want it, but we'll, we're really looking forward to, 
just sharing out. And of course, we'll be having other guests on so that we can highlight what does joy mean to them and how, how does the work that they do cultivate joy for students, for leaders and educators in all roles. I dig that. And, and I, I know it's a challenge um, because, and just thinking, look, look at this kind of a, like I have this map of the United States hanging up. I don't, but as I, as I'm visualizing the, 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 the United States and, and where she is on Pacific time and, in, in, uh, in, in Washington state and you and, and upstate uh, New York and both kind of extreme directions <laughs> Yes. And, and yet somehow your kinship uh, and the connection that you have, you're both willing to invest in and stay committed to. And, and I love when I see see that happening and in, in not just in education, but it, but in anything. So uh, I'm inspired by that. And I, and I look forward to um, pressing the sub- subscribe button when you're when your podcast lands. Uh, and look forward to, to future future listening uh, to that. So I know I know it's going to be great. Well, thank you, and we're excited about it. And Sean, we hope that you'll be a guest on it as well because we've already talked about that we want to be able to highlight you and your work and your voice as well. So lots of good to come because we want to know how are educators in all roles finding joy, whether it's in the profession, outside the profession, and and just. What are we each doing individually? So I think it'll be I think it'll be interesting to hear from just different voices and just for people to kind of tune into that and make connections for themselves. Awesome. Well, that is definitely um, a reason to celebrate Monday. That is yeah. when this podcast uh, is is beginning to usually drop. Although I don't know if uh, if I want to wait until Monday to do this today Saturday. I may just pop it out now. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, yeah, I look forward to being on 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 your podcast with you and Tisha, and because uh, I'm just big fans of both of you. So you you tell me when and where wherever you go, I will follow and uh, and gladly follow. So that's that is um, that is so so exciting. And of course, it'll be it will it will be on all Apple Podcast, Spotify, uh, Google Podcast, Anchor, all of those things. And again. The name of the podcast is I know Spark Joy, <laughs> Spark Joy in EDU. Take a magical leap into joyful learning. Awesome. Awesome. Spark Joy in EDU. Take a magical leap into joyful yep. learning. <laughs> wow. I did all of that uh, without cue cards. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love that. I can't wait for that to uh, to happen. If folks want to, to, to follow you and to uh, check out uh, what is one of my favorite uh, blogs? Uh, how how can folks connect with you and and follow your content and and learn and be inspired from you? Sure. Well, people can always go to my website, elizabethbostwick.com. It is with an S instead of a Z in Elizabeth. And then uh, my Twitter handles, my social media handles are all about the same. So it's half of my first name and my entire last name. So Eliza Bostwick. And you can find me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, I'm spotty on TikTok, but I give it a try every so often and LinkedIn as well and Facebook. So yeah, I'm happy to connect anywhere. Awesome. And and then if if folks are interested in, in picking up really one of the most sincere and, and heartfelt intentional books on, on innovation and, and culture and education, uh, Liz Boswick's book is Take the Leap. Ignite a culture of of innovation. It's off of uh, I am Press uh, books through George Coros under the umbrella of Dave Burgess uh, Consulting Inc. Uh, very very grateful for that. And then if you want to see how um, just another one of Liz's early works and and our uh, collaboration uh, through the great folks at uh, at Routledge Education, this book which we were really proud uh, to be a part of, Education Right Now, Volume Two. Top strategies for improving relationships and uh, and culture, and and really grateful for uh, our time together in Chicago with 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 a wonderful array of authors. And again, my best memory from the book is just you. You were like on a roll, on a roll. I and I, I and I remember you and I just locked eyes and just started laughing. Uh, it was just such a it was just such a great moment. Um, you just typing. I was like, man, this what is what is Boswick brewing over there? Because. Hey. 
once I get a thought going, I have to keep it rolling because otherwise that's why I also have to like take notes of what I'm thinking because it's easy to lose. Sometimes my best thoughts come to me just as I'm falling asleep at night. And I'm like, no, <laughs> so I don't want to disturb anybody else, but that's when my ideas come. And then if I wake up and if I don't write them down, they're gone. So yeah, you got, you got to write them out. Right. But that was an amazing time. And I have such admiration for that book and your work in that as well and everybody else's. And one thing that when I think of that time, I remember the quote of relationship, relationships matter, people. Remember that was like our motto because it was That's all right. about just connecting the dots and the importance of relationships and, and culture. So, so many, so many great memories. Yes, that was, that was just such a wonderful time. And, and, uh, Love in Chicago, and again, grateful, grateful for that. But no, I'm with you. When when you, I, I, I'm a sticky note guy, uh, and sometimes those ideas will will come to me um, in the morning uh, when when I go to my Planet Fitness and do my peace and balance time, and and I will I, I will either jot something down or I'll I'll, I'll text something to myself, and and uh, you, you you have to get when when you hit that moment, you don't want to lose it. And because I, I hate it when you have that idea and you've lost it, I'm like, well, man, I, I had it perfectly worded or I had it perfectly formed and it's gone. So I'm 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 with you there, my friend. I really am. I, f I feel bad for any any keyboard that's on the other side of those powerful <laughs> fingers of yours, because I'm telling you, man, it was... I'm going to have to be very mindful now. <laughs> no, 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 it was great. I loved it. No, Your don't. Keyboard. Ah, don't 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 worry about that. No, that's uh that's cool. But. But again, Liz, um, grateful for you. I'm grateful for your consistent spark of ignition for joy and and courage and innovation and and collaboration. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us on uh, the Principal Liner Notes. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sean. It's been an absolute joy to connect with you and just enjoy this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Folks, again, Liz Bostwick, please be sure to, to follow her and to, to check out her website and, and stay tuned for her upcoming podcast. This is the Principal Liner Notes podcast. As always, there is a flip side to the album. There is a flip side to the record. And, and folks like Liz uh, and Tisha and all of our folks in, in our professional learning network, we will always catch you there to collaborate to ignite sparks of joy, to ignite ideas. Thank you again. Don't forget that the world needs your voice and your gifts because you help make the world a better place, just like Liz Bostwick. Thanks again, and look forward to catching you on the flip side for episode 103. Excited about the guest that will be there, uh, a friend, uh, a musician friend, uh, Tom Caulfield, great guitarist. Uh, Liz, you will dig his his music, uh, very contemplative and soulful uh, instrumental acoustic guitar music. And I'm excited to have uh, a literal uh, musician uh, on the podcast next time. Thanks again. Tune in. Catch you on the flip side.